A Lifetime Endeavor August 15th, 1979 In one of the monastic rules of conduct, monks are forbidden from calling out loudly when they want to get other monks' attention. They should instead signal with their hands, because the Lord Buddha wanted them to have a quiet environment to meditate. During the Lord Buddha's time, the monks took up meditation as their lifetime endeavor. But nowadays, most of the monks and the laity don't. The Lord Buddha and the noble disciples or sadhakas taught only the practice of walking and sitting meditation, the places that were suitable for the meditation practices, and the methods used to eliminate the gilesas, tanha, and asava. The main topics of conversation that the monks had during the Lord Buddha's time were the salle katamma, which means cleansing or purifying. It's the cleansing of the gilesas from their conduct, speech, and thought. They should only be talking about cleansing and eliminating the gilesas because they took up the robe for this purpose and not to accumulate the gilesas. Right now, you only have the appearance of one who has gone forth. Originally, going forth was for the purpose of destroying all the gilesas, tanha, and asava. If you believe in this ideal but are not doing any practice, you'll instead accumulate more gilesas and defy the tamma vinaya. As a practitioner, you must strictly adhere to the tamma teaching that has been recorded in the scriptures and use it as your guide. The purpose of recording and preserving the Lord Buddha's teaching is to serve as a guiding light for those who are interested in the practice of mental development. Had it not been recorded, you wouldn't know how the Lord Buddha and the noble disciples practiced and became enlightened. Nowadays, you only study the scriptures and do not do any practice. All that you have learned are the descriptions of the Magga, Pala, and Nibbana. If your goal in studying the scriptures and practicing mental development is to become a famous guru, you'll unknowingly accumulate more gilesas and reject the goal set for you by the Lord Buddha. You should seriously think about this. You shouldn't rely solely on your teacher's instruction because it's not enough to make you wise. How do you become wise? You have to do a lot of investigation, analysis, and reflection and be always mindful of the sense objects that come into contact with your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and heart. If you don't use your sati and banya, you'll never gain any wisdom. The Lord Buddha and the Zavakas gained wisdom through their sati, banya, sadha, and virya. They didn't become wise by being idle and hopeless. When doing walking meditation, they didn't let their mind think aimlessly like the way you're doing, which is no different from people who don't practice walking meditation. Zati and Banya connect to form a formidable weapon to free your heart from the Gilesa's oppression. Sadha is the belief in the Magga and Pala, and the belief that having faithfully followed the Lord Buddha's teaching, you will become enlightened. You should always practice with diligent effort or virya to develop your sati or mindfulness and investigate with banya. If you always maintain your diligent effort, you'll never get tired of fighting the gilesas or be discouraged from developing your sati and banya. The jitta is the real thing. The body is merely a phenomenon. When you practice meditation whilst walking back and forth without any mindfulness, you're like people who go for a stroll, not like someone who practices meditation. But you're worse than them if you practice walking meditation without any mindfulness. You mustn't walk like that. The Lord Buddha's teaching, which has been recorded in the scriptures, can be very useful for your practice if you reflect on it with your sati and banya. However, usually you don't reflect on it, but merely chant it like a parrot chirping, Precious stone! Precious stone! When you give a parrot a precious stone, it doesn't know what to do with it, because it only knows about fruits such as bananas. You're like a parrot because you don't know the perils inherent in the Gilesas, Tanha, and Asava that you're passionately obsessed with and never seem to have enough of. You also don't know the worth of Tamma, which is like a precious stone. That's why you never want to have anything to do with the Tamma like applying your diligent effort. When you do walking meditation, your knees become weak, and when you do sitting meditation, it seems as if your bones and your body are bursting apart. When you develop sati and investigate with banya to remove the harmful gilesas, you become weak and discouraged and let the gilesas trample all over you and knock you out. All you can think is, 
This is hopeless. I have been striving so hard, but I can never enter into calm. So while you're doing walking or sitting meditation, your practice just turns in the Gelesa's favor because it's being driven by the Gelesa's, not by the Tamma. So how can you ever become enlightened? This is the way you should reflect if you want to gauge your success or failure. If you think with Banya, you'll know how far you've progressed in your practice. You should think, Today I have walked and sat in meditation. How were my jitta and sadibanya? Did I merely walk like people going for a stroll or sit casually? When people sit casually, it's not as bad as when I sit hopelessly and unmindfully. When I meditate, I should be striving for freedom from dukkha and should always remind myself of this goal. You mustn't be complacent because there's no reason in this world for you to be so. The Lord Buddha had always taught you to refrain from acquiring worldly possessions and pleasures because they are like fire. He said that they are all anitang, dukkang, and anatta, and are all unreliable, so you mustn't be attached to them. If you cling to them, it'll be like clinging to fire. The correct way to deal with them is to always reflect on their anitang, dukkang, and anatta nature. If you're attached to them, you'll always be afflicted with dukkha. The intensity of dukkha varies with the intensity of your attachment. There is no other endeavor for you but the practice of sitting and walking meditation. You should always watch your heart with satipanya if you want to catch the gilesa's tricks and deceptions, because satipanya is an indispensable tool for catching them. With satipanya, you'll always detect the gilesa's in whatever form they might appear in the heart, be it raga or dosa, lust or anger, because the heart is the one who knows and Zatipanya is the one who analyzes. You have to focus your attention at the heart in order to see the cause and the effect of Dukkha. But you mustn't merely wish them to disappear, for this is Dhanha or craving. If you want Dukkha to vanish, you'll have to find and remove the cause of Dukkha. Otherwise Dukkha will not disappear but will intensify to the point where you won't be able to endure it. For this reason, it's absolutely vital for you to watch your heart. I've tried my best to provide you with the opportunity to practice. I'm very protective of you and really care for you. I truly cherish the reclusive life and the meditation practice which I've devoted my entire life to. The results are really satisfying because it released me from Dukkha after I eliminated all of the Gilesas from my heart with my Satipanya, something not beyond your own ability. I'd really like to see you realize all levels of Tamma attainments, beginning with Samadhi. What is Samadhi really like? What kind of calm and coolness? If Satipanya is constantly focused at the Jitta and observing it, then the Jitta won't have time to produce any harmful thoughts to hurt you and will eventually enter into calm. When the Jitta becomes reckless and stubborn, then you must use the various techniques of Satipanya to restrain it, because Satipanya is superior to the Gilesas. This is Banya develops Samadhi. When the Gilesas are extremely wild, you must put all of your effort into taming the Jitta. It's a life or death situation. You must subdue the Gilesas with your Satipanya until the Jitta withdraws inside and calms down. I can confidently relate to you the experience realized from my meditation practice. When the jitta became very reckless with lust, raga, I had to subdue it with my satipanya until I was in tears before I could see its harmfulness. When I sat for a long time until the pain became very excruciating, I had to use satipanya to investigate the body. If I was using a mantra or being mindful of my breathing, I had to stop doing it when the dukkha vedana attacked with its full force. I had to continually investigate Dukkha Vedana with my Satipanya like two boxers punching each other. You can't afford to be off guard because when you are, you'll be vulnerable. It's the same way with your investigation. You must probe and analyze until you find and eliminate the cause of Dukkha. After you've achieved this, how can the Jitta's spectacular nature not appear? There is nothing in this world that could be more spectacular than a developed jitta. On the other hand, there is nothing in this world that could be worse than an undeveloped jitta. The jitta is very important because it's the indispensable container for all the different levels of tamma, especially the magga, pala, and nibbana. You must therefore strive to develop the jitta. 
when you fast, you should really concentrate on your meditation practice. Your exertion should be more strenuous than it would normally be. Fasting or reducing your food intake is a means of developing your mindfulness or sati. If fasting suits you, it'll make your practice easier and more fruitful than when you eat normally. If it doesn't suit you, it won't help your practice because you'll be thinking about food all the time rather than about your practice. When you fast, your body will become light, your jitta nimble and alert, your mindfulness ever-present, and you will experience no sleepiness. You'll see that your sleepiness comes from eating a lot of food. After fasting for two or three days, there will be no drowsiness left. You'll sit erect like a post, and your jitta will enter into calm very easily. There is nothing to bother your jitta. When you develop banya, it will flow very easily, spinning round and round. Regardless of the tamma level you're in, the methods of practice like fasting will always promote your progress if they suit your temperament. If they don't, they will become a hindrance. You shouldn't speculate about things that you haven't yet experienced in your heart, like imagining what karnika samadhi is like, what upadzara samadhi is like, what appana samadhi is like, or what the jitta's convergence into complete concentration is like. This is just imagination that will lead you away from the heart who is the one to experience and develop them, be it any kind of samadhi. The point is never to speculate what karnika samadhi, upadzara samadhi, or appana samadhi are like, other than experiencing the truth of these samadhis yourself, because this is the correct way to do it. It's like describing what a particular dish of food is like. Whether it's sweet or not really doesn't matter. Even a child who hasn't had any schooling about culinary matters will know if the food is delicious or not when he eats it. It's the same with samadhi. You have to experience it by developing it yourself. It doesn't depend on your speculation. That is useless and wastes your time. Be it any kind of samadhi, you'll get to know it yourself. You'll know what kind of samadhi suits you when you've developed it with your mindfulness and strenuous effort. After you've entered into calm, you'll know what it's like and how to achieve it. Normally the jitta likes to think a lot because it's always restless and agitated like a monkey. But when you've developed sati to control your jitta, like when you've continually concentrated on your mantra or any other meditation object, then the jitta won't have the chance to think aimlessly and will calm down. Whatever kind of calm it may be, you'll know it, as well as the happiness, ease, and comfort that accompany it, be it karnika, upadzara, or appana. The important point is never to speculate about them, because it's a waste of time and a hindrance to your meditation practice, especially when you're investigating for the truth. What you've studied from the scriptures or heard from your teacher are all speculation. If you apply it in your investigation, you'll ruin it and never become enlightened. The jitta will unknowingly think that it's the truth. Therefore, you mustn't let your speculation interfere with your investigation. If you want to become enlightened, you must always attentively watch your jitta. You're practicing jitta pawana or mental development. You are not practicing for the development of mental delusion. If you constantly study the jitta, you'll see clearly that the jitta is the knowingness or the one who knows. The Lord Buddha had to give about 84,000 different discourses to suit the needs of thousands of his devotees, who are like patients afflicted with different kinds of diseases. Is it practical for a doctor to use only one kind of medicine to treat all of his patients? Of course not. He must have many kinds of medicines to treat his patients. It's the same with the Lord Buddha, who couldn't give just one discourse to all of his devotees. The important point is never to speculate about the jitta, but to know it from your practice. In order to be firm and stable, you have to be firm in your development of samadhi and mindfulness. Your diligent effort is crucial for achieving your samadhi, or mental stability, which is vital for the investigation for insight or vipassana. With a calm jitta, your investigation with banya will be easy because the jitta won't be distracted with cravings. Samadhi is the jitta's nourishment that will keep it calm, cool, and contented. When you investigate, your satipanya will perform at full capacity, and you will become enlightened. You can take my words for it, because I've already experienced it myself. There are many levels of banya, but you shouldn't speculate about them. 
Banya will become skillful, quick, alert, sharp, and penetrating if it's being continually developed. You must develop Banya to eradicate the Gelesos if you want to achieve the goal of your going forth. You mustn't be unmindful when you do sitting or walking meditation. If you do, you'll unknowingly prostrate yourself to the Gelesos. All of your thoughts will be manipulated by the Gelesos. Instead of eliminating the Gelesos, you'll accumulate more of them. So you must never surrender because you're a fighter. You have to be serious and earnest in your practice. There's nothing more important than the activities of the Jitta. It's here where you'll have to focus your observation. The two mental components that are constantly active are Sankara, or mental concoctions, and Sanya, or memory. Sanya is much more subtle than Sankara because it doesn't have to concoct. It just recollects. It's similar to water that permeates through the ground. Sanya will subtly recall information and mental images. Both Sanya and Sankara are Anitta, Dukkha, and Anatta. If you don't know their true nature and what they are up to, they'll be used by the Gelesas to deceive you. You have to be resolute and earnest with your practice. I would really love to see you experience Samadhi and Banya because they are what you've devoted your effort for. The experiences that you've heard from your teachers and fellow practitioners are not your own yet. They are like merchandise in the market that you haven't yet bought because you haven't got any money. All that you can do is look at them. It's the same with the Lord Buddha's experiences like Samadhi, Banya, Magga, Pala, and Nibbana that you can only admire. Although you might have studied the scriptures a lot and you're very proud of it, just what have you achieved? All that you've accomplished was to commit the scriptural knowledge into your memory without a single Gelesa being eliminated from your heart. If you don't practice, you'll never experience Samadhi, Banya, Magga, Pala, and Nibbana, which you've memorized. Please understand this and get into your practice. If you develop Banya, you'll get Banya. You mustn't let other tasks distract you from your practice, because 99% of them are Gelesas. When you're not serious and earnest with your practice, then it will be 99% Gelesas. If the Gelesas have 99 weapons and Tamma has only one weapon, you won't be able to fight them. So you must develop lots of Tamma weapons by practicing seriously and earnestly. When you investigate the body, you shouldn't investigate perfunctorily, but investigate for true knowledge and insight. How many times you've investigated doesn't matter. You have to compel the Jitta to keep on investigating and not allow it to do anything else until you've achieved your goal. This is the way to make the Gilesa surrender. When you fight them by putting your life at stake in your investigation for the truth, the Gilesas will have to give up because your Satipanya is more powerful than the Gilesas. You'll see this very clearly. How can the Gilesas be stronger than the Satipanya taught by the Lord Buddha? When the Gilesas are forceful, your Satipanya, or the Magga, which is the suitable weapon for defeating the Gilesas, must also be equally forceful. When the Gilesas are less forceful, then Magga will also equally be less forceful. This happens in the early stages of practice when the Jitta is restless and agitated. It's like taming a buffalo, which will eventually have to surrender to the tamer. It's the same with the Gilesas, which will eventually have to yield to your Satipanya and diligent effort. It will become weaker, whilst Satipanya becomes stronger. The Jitta can then establish peace and coolness as its support. There won't be any restlessness and agitation that are like smoldering fire left inside the heart, like the fire that burns the rice husks. You have to extinguish this fire with your diligent effort. When the Jitta has attained to calm, it will have coolness as its support. This happened to me. The important thing is not to be idle. You must keep on practicing. When you sit meditating for calm and samadhi, or when you investigate with banya, you have to do it earnestly. If you're mindful in your investigation, you'll gradually discover the ways and techniques of removing your delusion and achieving insight. Investigating with mindfulness is crucial for realizing knowledge and insight. Whatever you do, you should always investigate and analyze. This is the way of developing banya. In the beginning stages of developing Samadhi, it's very hard, but you mustn't give up. 
If you do, you won't succeed. If you persist, you will eventually achieve calm. When you investigate with Banya, you should first investigate the body, your body and other people's body, to see that they are the living dead. Do you want to live with these living dead? Our bodies are the living dead. Are they beautiful? Are they real? Of course they're not. When you investigate on a supa, loathsomeness, and particula, filthiness, you'll find that these bodies are loathsome and filthy. When you investigate on death, Anitzang and suffering, dukkang, you'll see that these bodies will age, get sick, and die. This world is the world of the dead. You're just waiting for your death like animals waiting in line to be slaughtered. Once you're born, you're targeted by death. Death has already laid claim on you, whether you're a man or a woman, young or old. Some will die today, some tomorrow, and so on. You have to investigate until you see this truth if you want to develop banya to impact your heart. You've already been branded by death, but you don't know this because you're too preoccupied with your pursuit of happiness. You're like the cows and buffaloes that have been branded for slaughter. Anitzang, or impermanence, is constantly putting its brand on you. The sound that arises from this branding can be heard across the universe. That's how loud this branding is if it can be compared to a sound. If you listen, it will break your ears and burst your brain because the effect of anitsang, dukkang, and anatta can shake the whole world. Every part of your body is continually branded with the mark of dukkang, anitsang, and anatta. Even when you're sleeping, they never stop. They do it when you think, oh, this food is delicious. Do you know this? You have to investigate until you're truly impressed by this truth. Anitsang is impermanence. It's the truth or the law of the Vartajaka, the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. You must investigate until you can see this clearly. You must take control of your heart because it's your only real possession. Don't pickle it with the brine of Anitsang, Dukkang, and Anatta. You must free it from your delusion that makes you cling and crave for the non-essentials that are immersed in the mire of Anitsang, Dukkang, and Anatta. What good can you find from things immersed in the mire? Even a solid bar of gold once immersed in the mire will not look good. The heart is much more precious than a bar of gold. When it's immersed in the mire of greed, hatred, and delusion, how can it become precious? You should therefore free your heart from the mire of anitsang, dukkang, and anatta that constantly oppresses your heart. When you've seen the truth of anatta, You'll see that there are no people, animals, I, or they to cling to. You should earnestly investigate to see the truth clearly inside your heart and should not oppose the Thamma teaching, because it is the truth. The Kilesas and Thamma will always oppose one another. The Kilesas will make your views and understanding differ from the Thamma teaching and will destroy the Thamma teaching without you being aware of it. When you have clearly seen the truth, your jitta will defeat the kilesas. It will be firm and resolute like a warrior. Your exertion will be very intense. Your satipanya will probe relentlessly until you see all the truth. When banya starts to investigate, it will first probe the entire world to see without any doubt that everything is all made up of the four physical elements of earth, water, wind, and fire. When you have seen this truth, you'll let go of them. After that, the scope of your investigation will become narrower, because the kilesas and your delusions are fewer. Satipanya will now focus on the five kanthas, separating and identifying them. Its goal is to see the rupa kantha or body as merely a body, the vedana kantha or feelings as merely the three kinds of feelings of sukha, pleasant, dukkha, unpleasant, and neutral, Sanya as merely Sanya, Sankara as merely Sankara, and Vinyarna as merely Vinyarna. The four mental aggregates, or Nama Kanta, have a similar nature. When you investigate one of them and see its true nature, you'll also see the true nature of the other three. Once you've clearly seen their true nature, how can you not let go of them? You'll let go of them because the reason you've been clinging to them is simply because you didn't know their true nature. The goal of your meditation practice is enlightenment, insight into your true nature, and insight into the nature of your delusion that causes you to cling to a nitsang, dukkang, and anatta.
when you have clearly seen the truth of the five kantas, Satipanya will then probe inside the citta, because there is nothing outside to investigate any more. The scope of the investigation and the gilesas will converge into the citta, where the gilesas will be completely eliminated. When they are completely removed, what is left? Gone is anittang, gone is dukkang, and gone is anatta. Everything is let go of and left as it is. These three characteristics inherent in all conditioned phenomena, anittang, dukkang, and anatta, are the path to nibbana. When you've arrived at nibbana, these three characteristics will lose their usefulness. Like, when you travel on the road and arrive at your destination, the road that led you to your destination will become superfluous. It's the same with the citta when it travels on the path of anitsang, dukkang, and anatta until arriving at its destination, after which those three factors will serve no useful purpose. Your investigation that was spinning like a tamma wheel will stop, because all the gilesas have been destroyed. This was the endeavor of the Tamma practitioners during the Lord Buddha's time. They attained Magga, Palla, and Nibbana in the forest and on the mountains because they practiced for the elimination of the Gilesas. They knew that wealth and status were lures that would lead them to insanity, and knew that the Gilesas were the ones that enticed them with wealth and status. What can be more precious than the Tamma? You should fight the Gilesas until you become enlightened. You'll then let go of everything. Wealth and status are kid stuff, like children's toys. After you've become enlightened, you'll relinquish everything because they are all sammati, or supposition. Enlightenment is the most satisfying result. It's the fruits of your uphill struggle from start to finish, and the fruits of training, disciplining, developing, protecting, and nourishing yourself with the tamma that you should value more than anything else. You must consider the practice of mental development to be your most important endeavor, and must not do other work or activities just to alleviate your annoyance, as this will only serve to increase your frustration. When the jitta has achieved the ultimate goal, it will be blissful, and all problems will come to an end. The practice of mental development will also come to an end. It's not like the worldly undertakings that have no end. You'll do them until you die and carry with you to your next life all of your worries, confusions, and miseries. You'll never find any lasting happiness, ease, and comfort. But if you've accomplished the practice of mental development, you'll lose all your worries. This is an aleo, totally free of worries, because you've left all things as they are, even your body. Whatever should happen to it, you'll let it happen. You've already learned the nature of your body and know that it's a nitsang, dukkang, and anatta, just like vedana, jitta, and tamma. The Lord Buddha said that you must let go of all tammas at the final stage of practice. When you haven't yet arrived at your destination, don't let go of the path yet. But after you have arrived at your destination, you must let go of the path. You must not cling to it. All tammas refers here to all the sammati tammas or relative truths. When you've reached the final stage of practice, you'll let go of the path. At this stage, the jitta will become very subtle, and it will be totally immersed in the investigation. But when it realizes that all tammas are anatta, the jitta will completely let go of them. After you've passed beyond the nitang, dukkang, and anatta, what is this state? This isn't samadhi, and you won't describe it, because you know it's indescribable. This is the ultimate truth. You can't describe it, but you know what it is. You know this is the great sage, although it doesn't say it is so.